Hey, welcome to this session. And today we're going to be talking about roadblocks, tenacity, and communication. Roadblocks, the things that stand in our way, tenacity, what we need to get the job done, and communication. We're going to learn a lot from the life of Joshua as he took the baton from Moses and had to lead people into an entirely new culture. And that's what we're talking about, moving our people into a church multiplication culture from one where maybe it's been all about entertainment or meeting my spiritual needs or meeting the needs of my children, whatever. Uh, Moses had to take a bunch of people who were used to living in tents in the desert and turn them into farmers. Before that, he had to turn them into soldiers. He had eventually turn them into city dwellers. Uh, massive communication uh, was necessary to get this thing done. We're going to learn a lot from him as we get into it. But in this session, we're really talking about facing the realities of cultural modification because you do have some roadblocks in your way if you're attempting to turn your church into what I would call a church multiplication disciple reproducing machine. As we get started, I just want to remind you that your church culture, your current church culture produces its intended results. You may be you know, aspiring to multiplication, but the way that you have framed your church actually fits the best way that your church produces results. Uh, and that's what you're living with right now. And so I just want to kind of run back through these seven elements of culture that I think are so, so important that I got from the McKinsey 7S tool, shared values. And we're going to focus a lot on shared values because that really is the basis of everything. Style, your style, the style of the church has developed over the years, uh, skills that probably you lack that somebody else could bring to the table, which then guides you towards staffing uh, and volunteer staff, uh, professional staff, however you do this, micro church, whatever you're thinking about. And then from there, we start to get into strategy. How are we going to do this thing in the next five years? What are we going to do in the next 20 years? And then we can modify our structure to fit our strategy, which fits all of those other things that we talked about. Again, before we start modifying things, we got to get into shared values because we've got to teach people the whys of what we're asking them to do that are different. And then, of course, we build systems to support the structure and the strategy. And systems are another place where we get all hung up. You know, it's the way we've always done it, and we want to keep doing it that way. And so uh, these are really crucial things for us to be talking about. So I want to first talk about what I call organized roadblocks. Now, this may be your church board for any reason that, you know, you know, if you're going to uh, foment change in the church, you got to get to the board first. And they've got to completely understand what's going on. They've got to get on board with it. And you need to identify the people on the board who aren't necessarily going where you're trying to go and spend a little more time over coffee with those folks. Budgets stand in the way, particularly if your budget for next year is based on your budget for last year, because that's just a formula for staying frozen in place. You need to kind of go ground up with the budget every year. You know, what are we good at? What are we not good at? What are the opportunities that we face? And then as you start to look at the opportunities, start with those things as you begin to cast a budget. Put a little faith into the whole thing. You know, um, talking about boards and budgets, I was mentored by Robert Schuler when I was a young man. And he did a couple of interesting things. One of the things was that he always left a, a seat at the board table. They had a big fancy board room and all that. But there was an empty chair there at the head of the table. And that chair was for Jesus. He wanted to remind people that Jesus is the head of this church, not Robert Schuler. The second thing that he did that was very wise, and I adopted this, was never talk about financial reports or budgets until the end of the meeting. Talk about opportunities. Talk about faith. Get to a little blue sky thinking in there, and then you figure out how to fund it. And by the way, it's not the board's job to figure out how to fund it. It's the staff's job. But the board needs to say, yes, we're going in this direction. Now, you staff guys, you go figure out how to get the money in, you know, and what maybe we need to cut out in order to do something that's brand new. Because anytime that you're going to do something in a positive direction, it's going to cost you something in the other direction. And then there are these people that I call stakeholders. And here's a horrible example of a stakeholder. There are two churches in San Diego that we're planning to merge, planning for two years and actually meeting together. Uh, the, the older church had about 50 people, and they're all gray-haired people. They're all actually older than me. And um, so they were a little resistant to the younger church. There was some racial tension. There was this and that. Uh, but the two pastors were really in love with each other. Uh, the congregations had seemed to meld, 
But then there are the stakeholders. And there was one woman who opposed this thing. And she went out, it's congregational government in the church that had the campus. Uh, the other thing is new churches, and they're a little bit different than that. And this woman went out and, and, and rousted up a bunch of people who live out of state even, some people who live in state who haven't been in that church for years, but they're still on the log. They're in the membership book and they were capable of voting. And she defeated the, the merger by one vote. Now, these two pastors have been working on this. I mean, they must be just dying. Um, the churches have been meeting together in, in the same auditorium. And now the younger church has to go out and find a new place to, to meet. And the pastor of the older person's church is saying, uh, this is probably the death knell of this church. We're probably going to have to sell the property and hand the thing over the money over to the denomination. So you got to be careful of stakeholders. They're not your enemy. They're part of your flock. Uh, but they got to be your extra good friend if you're going to make changes. And then uh, lastly, there are our systems. Um, a lot of our systems are built around training module, modules that are, we, we make disciples and we make them effectively, but we make them to grow in the Lord, to serve the church, to give money in the offering. And that's basically it. This is being a good Christian, you know, uh, showing up, working in children's church, put money in the offering, being faithful to the church, um, knowing a lot of the Bible. Uh, this is this is it. Uh, specialty classes sometimes stand in the way. Again, I want to bring you back to what I'm calling a disciple-making continuum in a very simple way, just aligns what you're preaching on Sunday with what's going on in the middle of the week and helps people to grow all in the same direction at the same time. Uh, last thing that I see as an organized roadblock is disciple-making efforts that are basically knowledge systems. I'm just going to cram your head full of a lot of Bible knowledge, and there's not going to be a whole lot that comes out of that. And then we get into what I want to call less organized roadblocks. And uh, buildings, you know, I read when I was very young, I hadn't even started a church yet. I read an article and, and the headline of the article, I memorized it'll, it'll it'll stick with you like it stuck with me. And it is that we shape our buildings and then forever our buildings shape us. You know, you may need to tear down some walls. I was friends with a guy named Jack Hayford, Church on the Way in Van Nuys, California. And I went to see him one day and uh, they were throwing up some walls and it was exciting. The church is growing like crazy and had started, I think, with Jack had like 14 people when he showed up there in an old church building. And uh, they've grown to several hundred now. They bought some apartment buildings next door. They moved his office into one of the apartments. Uh, and, and I'm there and they're throwing up new walls. And it's like they're just getting ready for all this change. I went back to see him again. And about two months later, they were tearing down the walls that they had just built. They refused to let the building lead the church. The church is going to lead the building. Um, inertia stands in our way. You know, this is the way we've always done it. You know, and that's... There's, there's a certain validity in that. You want to honor the past and you want to protect what you have, but you want to be open to the future. <clears throat> I'm afraid some of our COVID-19 responses are, are in our roadblocks to our future. And by this, I mean, I, I, I've watched pastors, one pastor that I know who's extremely fun and funny and you know, if he makes a mistake in church, he turns it into a joke, and then he turns the joke into a teaching opportunity. And now, since COVID has come, uh, they don't meet in the high school anymore. They meet on a, on the church property of a of a wonderful congregation that's allowing them to use their property. Uh, but it's a very religiously structured building. There's stained glass all over and statuary and all that. And uh, it's it's a Protestant church, but it looks almost Catholic. And so they're recording they're they're not live anymore but the recorded video there and 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 the pastor is even using teleprompter he's reading the sermon so no more jokes no more mistakes no more funny things in fact he told me that he spends all day one day a week to get a 20 to 25 minute sermon he has to get it perfect so there's no us and all the stuff that you're going to find in this thing that are just little mistakes along the way and then of course and this relates to budget, but just financial fears. Uh, people are afraid of the future. Uh, I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm afraid of the future. My own finances, and I've invested well. But we, you know, we we have to overcome fear with faith. And 
And that's what we want to talk about as we get into this a little bit further. So I want to look at Joshua today. I've been reading Joshua. and uh, In fact, lately I've been uh, doing my devotions in a, in a John Maxwell leadership uh, Bible. And uh, it gave me a couple of little pointers. And then I found a whole bunch of other stuff here in these first six chapters of Joshua that I'd just like to leave with you. The first thing is that Joshua responded to a call from God. First nine verses of Joshua are all about Joshua. He was mentored, he was groomed, he was trained, but ultimately he was called because you can be mentored, groomed, and trained. And if you're not called, you're not going to tough it out when, when the tough gets going. And so uh, my challenge to you is, is God calling you to a culture of multiplication? Because I'm here to promise you it's not going to be easy. Uh, it's going to be rewarding. It's going to be fun. It's going to be exciting. But it's just not going to be easy. And so it uh, needs to be a call in your heart and you need to be listening to God. And if you haven't heard God, then you need to listen a little bit more. The second thing that he did that to me is absolutely crucial. This comes back to shared values is he directed the people to God's word. I, I mean, don't let the word of God you know, get out of your mouth, out of your mind, out of your brain. Uh, if if we're understanding that everything that we're doing is because it was supposed to be done because of the Bible, then we have a great deal of authority when we're trying to move our people in a new direction. If I were in your situation, uh, pastoring a church that existed for some time, or if I was starting a new church, I'd do pretty much exactly the same thing that I've done every time that I started a new church. I start out with the book of Philippians, and I just go chapter by chapter. There's four chapters. I take five to six weeks to get through there, partly just because it's so encouraging. <clears throat> it lists people up, and it gets them used to somebody traveling through the scripture rather than doing topical sermons, which I think is really important. And then after that, I go into the book of Acts, and basically I started out in Luke, and, and so that they see the bridge between Luke and Acts. And, and I get into the Great Commission a little bit in Matthew. But then we roll into Acts. And, and the whole deal is we're going to learn how to be church. We're going to learn the right way of being church. And, and then, and then we, we go through those early chapters when it's all about being and addition. And then we get into the later chapters where it's about multiplication. After that, I'll move a congregation into Romans. You can tell this is a long-term plan. And usually I take the, the, the church only through about the first 20 some chapters of Acts, uh, through the first missionary journey, basically summarize the next two journeys and then get into what goes on in the trip to Rome. And, and then I go into Romans because I want to put good, solid Bible doctrine under these people. And, and then after that, I figure by this time we've got problems. And so we go into first and second Corinthians to solve some of the problems, but it's all about God's word. You see, all of our plans, all of our strategies, all of our structures, all of our systems have to be rooted in the book of Acts, or I think that they're nil. They're, they're really kind of useless. And again, I'm the guy who pastored three churches in my life, and there's 2,400 churches around the world. So I think you need to kind of pay attention to what I'm saying here. Um, he defined the goal. And when you look at the goal, the first goal was we're going to cross a river that is, seems impassable. And the second goal was we're going to take the, this big city called Jericho. And, uh, and, and, and he's very clear about this is what God's called us to do. And then the larger goal of taking the whole land and everything that God had promised them. And then uh, an important thing here is he references Moses a couple of times in those early speeches. And he, he honors Moses. And one of the, the dangers in succession, you know, of, of the younger leader taking over for, for the older leader is to fall into the trap of competing against the past. You know, I've experienced this in, in a not real pleasant way or in a situation where I handed off and the guy that I handed off to was actually competing with me, competing with the past. Uh, rather than standing on the shoulders of those who had built the church and taking it forward, uh, it's like you got to tear it all down and start all over with the same people, with the great budgets, with the location, with everything that we had established before. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I just throwing all that away, but he's not. He's using all of that but recasting the church. And I, and I think that's a mistake. And you know what? I'm, I'm willing to forgive mistakes and I'm willing to forgive the past and all that, but I'm here to warn you, don't do it. 
uh, build on the shoulders of those who've come before you. When I was first pastoring a church, I mean, we were scared. Uh, we were reactionary because everything around us was so religious. Um, first real core of our church were a bunch of young guys who had found Jesus because somebody witnessed to him on the street. They went to a, a pretty religious organized church that you guys would all believe is godly. They love the Lord, whatever. But they were met at the door by an usher in a suit and tie who told them that their blue jeans and their long hair and a couple of them barefoot were not welcome in that building. If they'd get a haircut, wear the proper clothes, put some shoes on, they'd be welcome back. Well, those guys backslid. Pretty soon they're in the garage where they used to smoke dope. This is way back when marijuana wasn't legal in California. And they went back to where they used to smoke dope and, and started reading the Bible. They, they did a micro church, but pretty soon they were doing a micro church with marijuana. And pretty soon they were just doing marijuana. And then somebody found them and brought them to our church. So we were reactionary. We were very reactionary against what we saw as established religion around us. At the same time, I made heroes out of the pretty religious people who had mentored me and, and brought me to the place where I was because I knew that I was standing on their shoulders. And I wanted the credibility that they brought to the table. And so if you're, you know, sitting around where you're, you're building on top of something or you're in succession or whatever, uh, there's credibility in, in making heroes out of the people in the past. They engaged the goal in faith. Joshua engaged two goals in faith. And I, I want you to stop and think about how, 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 how silly he must have felt. I mean, God's told me that when we go to the Jordan River and the priests put their feet in the river, the river is going to part like the Red Sea parted and we're going through on faith. I want you to know that that took a lot of guts to just put yourself in that position because what if it didn't happen? What a fool you'd be. And then there was this great military strategy that came from the Lord. Uh, what are we going to do? And we're going to march around the city for six days. And then the seventh day, we're going around seven times and we're going to blow a trumpet. Woo! Boy, that takes courage. I mean, immense courage. You know, we got into a, a, a snare with the city of Honolulu when I was pastor. When we went to build uh, our, our civil engineer told us that the land was so steep that we're trying to build on. And there were so many problems. There was water that the state dumped onto the land. And there wasn't enough drainage that the city had at the bottom of the hill. And we had to absorb all the water. We ended up spending a million dollars building like an aqueduct under the ground to, to, to hold all this water. Millions of gallons of water. Um, they said there were seven fatal flaws in the property. You will never be able to build it. Well, there were more than seven flaws because once we got into the bureaucracy, we just met the people who didn't like church. And a lot of them were Buddhists, a lot of them were whatever, agnostics. And they just fought us at every turn. And the mayor came to our rescue. He was a Christian. He was a great guy. And there were uh, six or seven times that he actually walked into somebody's office with a guy from our church there and demanded that they put the rubber stamp on the thing and let us go forward. And because of him, we were able to build the property. God supplied in that way. Well, then the mayor gets in trouble. There's this hiking trail um, about a mile, mile and a half away from our church. But there's a road that's the top boundary of our church property that's now defunct. They used it when they were building the H3 freeway. And so the road has been shut down, but it's still there. And it would go from our property to this hiking trail that goes way up this mountain. It's actually called Stairway to Heaven. The problem was that people were cutting through the local neighborhoods on their way to Stairway to Heaven. Tourists, they got on the, on the internet. There were thousands of tourists and there were horrible things that were happening. Somebody took a dump on somebody's lawn. There was trash all over the streets. Uh, people were filling their canteens out of people's garden hoses and then leaving the water running. Uh, the, the newspaper had shown up, the TV station had shown up, the mayor was in trouble. And so uh, they came to us and, and, and here was a proposal. A parks department came to us and said, we would like to build a gate at the top of your property onto that road. We have to build a big concrete stairway and all that. And we want to rent 12 parking spaces from you that we could use on the weekends to take the pressure off the mayor. And oh, by the way, we don't even think anybody's going to want to go to your church property and then hike all the way up to the thing. They're probably going to still go through the neighborhood, but it's going to take pressure off of us because we did the right thing. Well, you know, time goes by, uh, over a year goes by, and the gate is never opened. And then uh, there's some kind of a 
thing and there's a reopening of the stairway to heaven and we get a call from the city actually i was home on my day off and we got i don't know half dozen calls from the city and they wouldn't let the city through to me because they're protecting me and when i say the city i'm talking about the mayor and the city managing director the top two guys in the city they're my friends but by the time that we do talk on a Tuesday, they're really mad at me because they couldn't get through to me before and the pressure is on. They wanna open the, the gate the following Sunday. I mean, this is Tuesday, we're gonna open on Sunday. And it, it's probably gonna be uh, three or 400 cars for those first couple of weekends, Saturday and Sunday. And then after that, it'll probably dwindle down. Don't worry about it. And I'm going, whoa, 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 we have about 157 parking spaces. And you're saying 300 cars. We won't be able to hold church all weekend. And if we go two weekends without an offering, uh, we're pretty much underwater. It isn't going to work for us. And, and so we got attorneys involved. We did this. We did that. There was no hope. And then someone discovered that in the contract we had signed for them to be able to build, I mean, they spent $100,000 building this stairway and all this stuff and fencing and this beautiful gate and all that. Uh, but they had promised to pay us like $100 a month in rent. And there was a clause that they had written in there that said, if you, if the city doesn't pay rent for a year, then the contract is null and void and they have no right to that access. Well, somebody discovered that after this event and this is the event that i want to talk to you about that's kind of like joshua marching around the city or joshua putting the priest's feet into the into the water and all that we're praying we're freaked out it's it's like wednesday or thursday tuesday we've had the calls and and and, and in the prayer meeting there's like 25 of us in prayer meeting, staff prayer meeting and in that prayer meeting somebody comes up with a kind of a prophetic word that Ralph and Aaron, who started this church, Aaron Suzuki and Ralph Moore, are supposed to go stand in front of the gate, speak to the to the lock, and, and tell it, we forbid you in Jesus' name ever to be opened. Well, you know what? A couple days after that, the clause was discovered. The city had no right. Um, we're free. Uh, God answers prayer and he, and, he, and he directs us sometimes to do some strange things that call us for faith. But when we're willing to step out in faith, well, then God's willing to honor that faith. So Joshua engaged faith. He memorialized the miracle as, as soon as they had gotten across the river. They took 12 stones out of the river and they built this little monument and, and they memorialized the past. This is where hero making comes in. This is where we talk about the things that God has done. This is where when we started our first daughter church, almost by accident, uh, I, I'm, I'm just standing up there every week bragging about whatever their accomplishments were. Rather than our accomplishments, we talked about those things, but I want to brag on what's gone on out there because that's the miracle. That's the, the new birth. That's the multiplication factor that we're after. And so we, we memorialized that. Uh, he memorialized Israel's identity. And Joshua did it in a painful way. He circumcised all the males in the place. It turns out, you know, that God had told Abraham to circumcise. God had told Moses to circumcise. In fact, he threatened Moses when he told him to circumcise. When they first got out of Egypt, Moses circumcised everybody and then apparently didn't do it anymore until Joshua comes along and has to go back and and, and memorialize the identity of Israel because that's what circumcision was all about. Well, when I memorialized things in our church, it was things like love your neighbor as yourself. We, we made a slogan. We promise to love you as is. We're not gonna be religious. We made another slogan, Hope Chapel, the people place. And we slapped this kind of stuff all over everything, but we wanted to, to, to just really build this its identity into our church. When we were in Hawaii, uh, we were like the the second biggest Protestant church in the state of Hawaii. For a while, we were the biggest. And so we had quite a few cars on the road. We had seven services a weekend. And uh, so we made bumper stickers. We were the first church in Hawaii to make bumper stickers. And we, we, we went to a surf shop and bought a bunch of bumper stickers from there. And we copied the coolest one. And we made it so that it would really stand out and have people stick them in their windows and, and whatever. And we, we, just, we just put it out there. This is who we are. 
And by the way, if you put a sticker in the window of your car or on the bumper of your car, your friends are going to go, what the heck is that? And guess what? You're talking about your church and that's not a bad thing. And then in chapter six, we read that, that the nations around were in fear of Joshua and he utilized his reputation. He used the fear against his enemies. Well, when it comes to utilizing your reputation, you start planting churches. I promise you that people who have a call in their life to plant churches and don't know what to do with it because the church that they're in uh, rejects what they want to do, they're going to show up and it's going to make it a little bit easier for you. I call it low hanging fruit. Every time we've gone into the city and started planting churches, all of a sudden guys come out of the woodwork who've been toying with this for years, didn't know what to do with it. And I showed up and it's like, oh man, you're the fourth member of the Trinity. Can you help me do what God called me to do? And it just makes it so much easier for us to build momentum into what we're trying to do. And so I just want to leave you with this. You need to apply the lessons of Joshua to your words, your budgets, especially your stakeholders, to your systems, to your buildings, to this inertia that says this is the way we've always done it. This is where we have to inject faith into the pro process. And the Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We're back to God's word. We're back to shared values. We're going to win today. Hey, God bless. Thanks for taking time to listen to this.